I don't quite remember when the word classic came into my vocabulary. I used to be some random yuck who never read anything but manga or webcomics until someone introduced me to novels and there was no turning back. Going up in the midst of the internet's growth and cultural importance, I guess I kind of just absorbed what a classic was. To me, a piece of classic literature was probably a bit of pioneering work. It was so ahead of its time that to this day, people still related to it. The first such piece I read from start to finish was probably Pride and Prejudice, and let me tell you, it was not an easy read. <laughs> Works from the 20th century usually were to me, and I would know. We were forced to read Noli and Elfidi in high school. I read Austin's book in my first year of college. So I tried to broaden my horizons. The second book was Catcher in the Rye, and I think I fared better with that one. The writing is a lot simpler, even if the monologuing was a little dry. And in that brief moment of trying to broaden my horizons, I realized some things. One was that classic literature is, was, is unerringly boring. I didn't even attempt anything with any Shakespeare scripts because honest to god it would have bored me to death. Second was that these classics are too expensive to only bore me to death, and I didn't have the resources at the time to read the public domain ones that are probably up on Project Gutenberg as we speak. I was never given any pocket money for books, and what money I saved from not eating lunch always went to giving my niece or my sister gifts or school projects, that, and I honestly didn't even consider Project Gutenberg as an option because I had no idea what the hell it was. We do not have libraries where I live. It's not a well, it's not an option you have, all right? Libraries are few and rare between. So I moved on to classic cinema, which was a lot easier to pirate. There's not really a set cinematic canon. I think I just went by whatever people were calling classic and what was most referenced in other films. So it's works like Akira or Charlie Chaplin films and a lot of Stephen King book to screen adaptations like Misery, Carrie, and The Shining. What do you know? They're also incredibly boring. <laughs> I know that most people would say that I probably lack some critical thinking skills or am a masochist if I'm consuming these works looking for wonder and enjoyment. I don't know. I do see a lot of people engage with these works and genuinely enjoy them. You know, I, I just don't. And I think people are allowed to have their likes and dislikes. I think I just felt a little disappointed in myself for not being able to find any significant joys from these apart from occasional laughs and whatever notes I left on my copy of PNP. A lot of them is just me memifying it, which is something I do with things that I was like I'm forced to study in school. <laughs> so I don't I don't think that's a good metric. <laughs> they just didn't stick to me as well as I thought they would. On cinema it was pretty much the same thing. People say that The Shining is unnerving and horrifying, but apart from shots so long I thought Netflix was freezing on me, it was just a really quiet and boring horror film. Then you get anecdotes from the production side and you realize that the creator of the film is a horrible, horrible man. And I don't care if he's pioneered shit in cinema, skill does not justify bad shit. This is not a sports anime. <laughs> I think I could get a little bit of the hype for Pride and Prejudice though. Austin had some very solid character writing and a really good grip on voices, but the writing from before the 20th century just feels so contrived to me at times. Well, most of the time. The paragraphs are long and go to descriptive diatribes that honestly just remind me of Rizal waxing poetic about Manila and Laguna, and I think that's pretty much why. So get this, right? I did some digging and apparently the literary and cinematic canons have some major differences and one big major similarity. For one, the literary canon was made by educators, mostly white, cishet men from the west. 
America. No, um, the making of it had a lot to do with social capital. That's why a majority of the literary canon are national works and are dull as fuck. It's for the young heirs of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who were rich enough to go abroad to network and attend colleges, etc., etc. Chrysostomo Ibarra types who soul search in Europe and come back to inherit their father's legacies. Rich people shit. So classic literature was always going to be to educate people about morals and critical thinking and all that stuff. That's why you have one bank books like 1984 or Animal Farm on it. That's why as time moved on, more and more works from people of color, specifically black Americans, were added to the canon. Education shifts and changes with ideals and the flow of politics. So, even if the literary canon was once for wasps to learn about quote unquote white culture and its enduring power and eternity, now the canon prioritizes works that embrace progress, change, plurality. I don't know what all is on the list of the literary canon at the moment, but considering the ongoing book banning is still taking place in American high schools, I don't think it's as progressive as most people think it is yet. Cinematic canons are a lot more recent, and though there's a lot of favor put in critical opinion, the masses make most of these lists. It also helps that there isn't one set cinematic canon made by just anyone anymore. You have sites like IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, Litterboxd, etc. You know, <laughs> I don't go here, so I'm just taking guesses. Most people would say that cinematic canons are determined not just by the West, but by everyone, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> Get it? But I don't think so. A classic these days is a marketing strategy. And a lot of cult classic films, and even just general classic films, are almost definitely made by Western studios, most of which are American. And yes, you have some Japanese films here and there, both animated and live action, so let's expand the term. These are just works from the global north. Some classic works of literature like 100 Years of Solitude break that, but for the most part, if you go through a list of works from the literary and cinematic canon, they're mostly western and come from the global north. <laughs> and I kind of stumbled onto this a while back, wondering why exactly these works were canonized, so to speak. They aren't works that are objectively good, at least from my perspective, and they definitely aren't works that have a lasting impact on me specifically. Subjectivity breaks down their titles as the greats that stood the test of time, because if they were that great, surely some simpleton like me would get it, right? The one thing they all had in common was that they were deemed classic and iconic and therefore continuously last and endure within the mainstream consciousness because they were deemed classic and iconic by the mainstream consciousness. It's a self-perpetuating cycle. And the damage that does for a lot of works I consume these days is that the continued existence of these works within the mainstream consciousness makes it harder for more impactful works by creators from the global south to be disseminated to, well, readers from the global south. Well, readers, viewers, audiences? Let's go with that. It's like trying to advertise your work by a very loud river. Most people will hear the fucking river. This phenomenon pretty much evokes that read another book or watch another movie reaction from most people who are tired of these works. It also makes it so people uplifting transformative works or fan fiction can go, oh, publishing these days is so conservative and heterosexual and boring. I also know a lot of people are like this about films like Citizen Kane or whatever Disney or Pixar release these days or books like Harry Potter or hell, let's expand it from books and movies. Let's, people are like this about TV shows like Friends or How I Met Your Mother and The Big Bang series or um, Hello Lucy? Man, whatever the fuck. Watch, watch reviews of WandaVision. You, you'll, you'll get it. They're, they're gonna be like, oh, this was a classic, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I've never watched these films. Never watched these TV series. And if I do ever watch them, it's not for me. You, you get it? You get it. Whatever. <laughs> Comic series from the media giants like Marvel and DC. 
games released by AAA companies, etc., etc. The list goes on. Supporting and promoting works from independent and largely non-white and non-Western creators becomes a lot more niche and a lot more subversive and underground. They turn into countercultures, essentially. The thing is, I understand the need for gatekeeping countercultures. Creative works making it into the mainstream dulls its originality, almost certainly because of the way capitalism works. Once a work gains traction, companies start mimicking attributes of it that they think attract its consumers. It gets reproduced and you get knockoffs with all the edges buffed out for the mass market. I think a best example of this is the Hunger Games trilogy. For the most part, The Hunger Games was one of the best political commentaries on the way media sensationalizes, suffering for the entertainment of, and generally just getting some type of reaction from, the privileged. At the time, at least. The author wrote the book as an observation of reality television and the media representations of conflicts in Iraq. In turn, it also has the best portrayal of how propaganda works and what propaganda is. When it was released for the big screens, The Hunger Games turned into the exact thing that was being commentated on in the books. Fans and the companies making these films focused on the romance were thrilled by fight and death scene and were in awe by the foreignness of these lands and events. Surely they're far from reality and mostly fictional because <gasps> We don't see and experience the way children die on TV, and we don't forget the way these children's families and countries are suffering once we turn off the TV. Right? This was before doom scrolling was a thing, obviously, because Suzanne Collins could not have predicted doom scrolling. In short, though, the political commentary was buffed down in favor of the thrill and comfort of fantasy. Then came the countless dystopian knockoffs that also mostly focused on romance and factions and yada yada yada. Then came the people who disparaged dystopian fantasy works afterwards, ignoring the fact that this all stemmed from political commentary, not just dystopian fantasy. So I guess turning works from the global south into classics shouldn't be the goal here. <laughs> Icons and classics. They're usually rusty old coins. You know they held value at some point, <laughs> but they're mostly useless. I guess I'm just a little mad. I don't know by what capitalism, self-perpetuating cycles, the bar access to people who need it, all that stuff. But yeah, you may have noticed this is different from usual. I'm actually winding down from intensive videos like my first 10, mostly because I enrolled to college again recently. I'm well, I moved. <laughs> the script says I'm moving again, then I realized, oh, I'm re-recording this after. Uh, I've already moved. Anyway, I moved, I volunteered to do some stuff, I have a podcast to manage, and also because, well, I think I've lost sight of what these videos were originally for. Um, during that first year, I think I wanted my stuff to stand for something, and to just say stuff that most people won't think, you know, acknowledge fandom biases general biases, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Around the second year, these videos, they're for me. Mostly. At the time of writing and recording, the last comment I got on a video was on the Bad Genius one. And it honestly brought me down a little bit. You know, maybe I should just keep doing what I want, talk about what I care about. So if you clicked on this video, thanks. If you supported me in the making of this video, honestly, I owe you. Like, an entire month, I was like quiet because um, I knocked my coffee mug into my laptop and I couldn't get access to another laptop until I moved afterwards. <laughs> so um, uh, it, it, it has been very eventful. I probably should make an announcement at some point, but I did make an announcement on Twitter. Uh, most of my audience, I would suppose, come from Twitter. Um, I, I say as if I actually have an audience, but whatever. And before it passes, because I'll be busy for the first two weeks of May, due to my birthday and elections, thank you all so much for a happy first year of me rambling into the YouTube void. May this last longer than anticipated. And Thank you all so much for 100 subscribers, um, however many of you still watch what's going up. 
Likes and comments are appreciated. Subscribe if you want to hear more. Financial support shall be forked over to my Kofi, where you'll be able to get videos five days earlier. Updates from scripts, bloopers, etc. Discord server. We have a Discord server. Um, there's not a lot of engagement in there. <laughs> but anyways, as always, stay safe. Ingat tayong lahat. Bye! Good lord.